failure should matter the more failure matters more we are engrossed in the moment actions you don't need courage to take actions is the actions that bring courage it's irrespective of which i will feel whether you're building i don't know pain killer or white queen i think everyone should study human motivations is all the stakeholders are human this some you said something about gamification i think that itself is a huge thing but i think it's one of the most poorly understood words the joke in our company is it's like writing cpu sexual on bumble everyone writes it no one gets it <laughs> other thing is maybe it just to do with the bringing yeah we have come from lot of lower middle class income household you have to hack monetization so i have always been hacking monetization all my life but the nuance there is i think people got over excited just like through nft tech you can't create mona lisa nft can enable it mm. but the underlying concept is still the underlying concept Hi everyone, welcome to Matrix Moments. Uh, I'm really excited for the episode today for two reasons. One is uh, I'm talking to Dilshir, the founder of Zupi, uh, somebody that I really, really enjoy spending time with and uh, always learn something new when I speak to him. Uh, the second is we're doing this from a new office in Delhi, uh, which is where Zupi is also based. So thank you, Dilshir. Thank you for taking your time and doing this with us. My pleasure, Didi. Uh, I think has been what three, four years we've been together. About four years, yes. Yeah. Uh, always been an amazing partner and mentor to me, and very grateful to you and Matrix. No, it's been our pleasure and our our honor actually to be part of the journey. So, Dilshan, I'm going to start with uh, uh, something that I think uh, for somebody on the outside, you know, Zupi is a another real money gaming startup, mm. right? Uh, but I know what attracted me to first sort of uh, invest in Zupi and partner with you on this journey was. I always felt that you thought about the game and the company and the mission much more deeply. You always looked at Zupi as being in the business of providing joy, in the business of giving happiness, um, and not just as another real money gaming company, right? So let's unpack. Given that also Zupi is, I guess, you haven't really been out there marketed either yourself or the company, despite all the success. Um, for for just kind of you know uh, my understanding and for whoever watches this, uh, tell me about what was the motivation to start Zupi and uh, how has that evolved over time? Sure, I think it's gonna be a bit of a monologue and a long answer. And you know me, I can only give meta answers. So give it to me. So I think it starts early. So always has been very introspective kid. Uh, always. Would like to go deeper into concepts and start reading philosophy earlier. Uh, that almost caused an existential crisis as well. <laughs> you know, those big, hairy questions. You know, what's meaning of life? All those things have always fascinated me. So, and the structure or the framework I got when I went to IIT Kanpur. I joined as a civil engineer, graduated as a chemical engineer. But uh, my true passion I found there was psychology. So. There's a humanities course you have to take in first semester, and it took introduction to psychology, and I was like, I found my thing. Uh, so that's how it started. So, but I realized like studying human behavior is very, very convoluted. The lot of different fields of science one has to study to arrive at a deeper understanding of mm. human mind and behavior. And this is something I'm deeply fascinated with. So you, so I started studying evolutionary biology, how we evolved from a single cell to multicellular organism because a lot of our Genetic software is hardwired. Then you study anthropology of cultures are wired us. Then you study genetics, parent-child relationships, hormones, food as well as neuroscience, all those things, and even linguistics. You know, even the language we use shapes our behavior. So all of this starts with a deep fascination for studying human behavior. And you know the classification we talk about: painkillers and vitamins. So being deeply fascinated by building vitamins because they are around understanding fundamental human motivations. So this is like the background, and then comes back to why do Zupi, why start Zupi, what were we trying to build or what were we trying to solve? So I think I always fascinated with this question: you know, what's the most important problem to solve? And while there are a lot of startups and businesses which have been always working on you know longevity, extending human life, but I have always been fascinated: what about quality of life? Right? Even if you look at the metrics through which countries measure their Growth and and success. 
these are happiness index yeah. these are gdp right domestic production but what about i don't know happiness question and other things so that is how it started started thinking about you know what do humans really want so the thesis evolved it starts as ki maybe everyone just wants pleasure then uh, but pleasure i saw is like a short set but what about something transformative that's when i came across the concept of flow state mm. so flow state is basically you're so deep and gross in the moment and you lose basically yourself and that has been positively correlated with all forms of wellness across cultures ethnicities gender so that's when i came across gaming and flow state as like because no one designs flow state better than game designers right so just double clicking on what flow state is it's basically the environment and the skills are in a certain uh relationship mm. if things are too difficult we get anxious if things are too easy we get bored it's about cracking the right balance between the two between the two and then there has to be real time feedback and third is failure should matter the more failure matters more we are engrossed in the moment the best example of that is rock climbing so in ancient greek times it was seen as punishment you know climb a mountain and then come down and you can slip and die yeah. why do people do that because it's again timing patterns which pattern to find then and error matters failure matters yeah so looking at all of this then i thought gaming makes a lot of sense right to tackle that problem but again in gaming now the idea was how to do gaming so the and this is very clear i'm not a philosopher i'm a business person at the end of the day you really so yeah <laughs> so then it's like okay uh, and i think we we would touch on monetization something i'm deeply fascinated with i see monetization as fun step difficult problem to solve than engagement specifically in a time rich country like us so it's like how can i marry this and that's when the i came across the concept of pay to play gaming uh, that's when it suddenly clicked so the monetization model the previous which is in app purchase and advertisement hasn't been working it is improving but still in terms of comparing to rmg it's not especially in india yeah yeah especially in india it's not there we can maybe dig deeper why is that later so but at the same time this concept of failure matters mm. and that's what i resonated in my childhood days as well you know when we used to play gully cricket and i used to be a super competitive kid you know the guy who's telling all his team mates seriously hello you to pehli ball pe kyun bat guma rahe dive mar all those things that's what i realized when they were like small small skin in the game like we were in tournaments the engagement excitement was all together at a different level so that's how all of it kind of came together and we ended up launching an rmg platform Oh, I love the I love the point on skin in the game because I know one thing I've been a uh, I'm still a maybe not a daily active user but I'm a weekly active user of Supi. The thrill of you know winning even though the amount may be small. Yeah. Uh, that skin in the game really ten x is exciting. Absolutely. Uh, so so I know what you mean. So I'm going to double click on one thing you said. You spoke about human motivation, and if you remember last month when we were here, we had Sanjeev come over and he made this line, which is a very simple line. a uh, statement to make but it's so insightful and he said the best businesses in the world are built around us simple consumer insight yeah right uh, and you've spoken a lot about human motivation right tell me a little bit about given you know we all talk about gamification as applied to every business mm. but you are running a gaming business mm. itself right how have you studied human motivation human desires human sort of uh, uh moves mm. um different chemicals and how they influence behavior uh how is that give us maybe one or two examples of how you actually used your study and mm. depth of research in this mm. to build a better gaming uh uh company yeah i think it's is respective of which i will feel whether you're building an no pain killer or white man i think everyone should study human motivations is all the stakeholders are humans your customers are humans your investors are humans your teammates are humans your policy people regulators are humans so studying that and we don't actually have that culture in india uh, humanity is still not very mainstream so i think anyone and everyone should study that uh, first of all now talking bit about that so I think it flows into everything and everything we do. Like let's let's talk about the game choices that we make. I'll maybe touch upon that at a high level. So when we were starting, we were like three games that were really working in RMG space. There was daily fantasy sports, rummy and poker. By working, I mean like having a hundred million dollar kind of and scale, right? And and that also 
whenever something works, it also causes like bubbles, right? So what we saw, a lot of these people are going on Play Store, taking the most popular game and integrating payment gateways and thinking, voila, we have one also great there. So we saw why these three games worked and why other like whatever 250 had failed. What was the common theme on game in these games and what, what not in other? Mm. So decoding that absolutely to the first principles, like why this work, why doesn't doesn't work, and what are the meta game mechanics in each of the formats mm. that work. So that's where we came up with the thesis. Like we see in RMG, there are three major segments: there's fantasy sports, there's card games, and casual games as a category was not there at all in the RNG set. So what are those, you said when you broke it down, you said there are underlying sort of things that make these games successful. Yes. Just tell us a little bit about, like, what did you find? So, it's, in a way, comes down to, see, any engagement or monetization is byproduct of user personality in game meta tags. Yeah. They meet and some magic happens. So it's about really understanding at that level, you know, why certain games work, what kind of personality traits people have, why do some people play PUBG kind of a game, so why do some people play Candy Crush kind of a game, why do people some play Quiz kind of a game, right? And all can actually be broken down into personality traits. Mm. So that is the approach we took, like casual gamers are still, even at that time it will be 300 million casual gamers in India. We are very curious, why has no one been able to crack a casual RMG model? Again, by crack, I mean scale of 100 to 200 million dollars. High in profit. Yeah. Yes. So that really fascinated us. So the idea is always not building a plane, but to understand why things fly. Because then you can build a spaceship or whatever you want to do. So it's just looking at those fundamental game mechanics. Like, let's take an example. Let's take any game like chess. Mm. So break it down all the those pieces components. that are there. So what is there? This board, there are different kinds of PCs. There is a start point, end point, how rules, uh, what is the sequence you move in, how the points are scored, how that piece can move. So break it down everything and now re-engineering it in a way that the final format is actually better than the older format. And that's what we have done in our, our premium game Ludo. And it's not just RMG, uh, even our free-to-play, uh, I think you guys would have seen the study yeah. report. After PUBG Free Fire, we were the third highest time spent game. So not just RMD, the yeah. free-to-play version had much higher engagement and uh, retention compared to original formats as well. So it actually comes down to those pieces, break it down everything, and then rebuild it again, seeing what works. So let me ask you one question over there, actually two two questions. When when we invested, when you and I first met, I remember Zupi was a quizzing game, right? Uh, and very successful one of that. Very engaging, people loved it. There was a lot of uh, uh, top line scale. Uh, you were still figuring out how to kind of monetize it and sort of build build around it. Uh, but very quickly you took what I thought at that time was a was a very hard call to say, you know what, I'm going to build something very different. And then you moved to Ludo and obviously today now you're a, a platform with multiple games, several of doing, them doing well. Uh, how did you think through that uh, pivot? It was a hard call at that time. Uh, and second is, Ludo as a game, multiple people, like you said, right? It's not about building the plane, it's about understanding why things fly. Multiple people have tried to replicate Ludo's success or, you know, uh, uh, the Zupi's Ludo game, uh, uh, they've tried to replicate that. Nobody's really been able to scale it uh, uh, as much as you have. Uh, Without revealing your secret sauce, what what can you tell me about who you know on both these? Yeah, uh, you rightly said we started as a quizzing platform, and you know there was a massive scale in terms of spend, where it was like some crazy numbers. But what we figured out was that the unit economics or the margin, there were some issues in that that just wasn't happening. And that again goes back to the fundamental game mechanics. Mm. That what we realized was, hey, this game can get massive skin. But in terms of long-term retention, high LTVs, it's going to high margins, it's going to struggle a bit. So, again, without going into details, we realized that again, in the journey of understanding why things fly, there were some missing pieces. And those might have been very difficult to fix. But at the same time, we identified this gigantic opportunity, untapped. And nobody was doing it. And nobody time. was doing that. And one of the... So in some sense, you were... Do you think first to market played a role? Or is it something else? I think definitely. And the other thing is, like I said, 
like you touched upon again understanding why ludo rmg wasn't working like one simple insight is the biggest problem is uncertainty about the endpoint hmm. now you might want to start a game and it might go on for two hours no one wants that specifically yes. when you've invested money right yes you just want quick i want certainty the example i give is uh there used to be power cuts when i was a kid and i had to watch pokemon at 5 pm so they were announced power cuts now you used to be okay okay <laughs> 5 pm the light is going to come and just unannounced power like Yeah. Turning the light on and off, so it's lot of anxiety yes. when there is uncertainty. So this is like one simple insight that we took, and we have changed lot of mechanics along with that. So I think it goes back to neuroscience. Like there have been so many studies about this that when there is hundred percent clarity, you are gonna get a reward, or there is a seventy five percent probability you getting a reward versus fifty percent of probability we getting a reward. That highest dopamine it is when there is fifty percent. right so again understanding the mechanics how we are wired what causes what so it's it's the law is very very clear and the game has to be dominantly skill but not pure skill yes so how do you balance that while also delivering a great experience but also ensuring your game is dominantly skill so that's where designing a state of the art quantitative framework for defining what is game of skill and what is game of chance was super helpful because then you know which side you are playing on and we have built that framework uh the industry has accepted that framework and we have worked with all the top professors and got better than and it was first of its kind so again it goes back to understanding the first principles what is that if you understand that then you can tweak make changes rather than blindly doing anything yeah and coming back to the previous question i don't know if i could be completely sort of do justice to it Ludo worked really well. It continues to scale and you know grow very uh, profitably. What? How did you think about eventually making the platform shift? A lot of your peers had made the plat platform shift much earlier, uh, but for whatever reason, haven't been able to, uh, I guess, see as much success as you, right? Mm. Uh, how did you sequence this in your head? Mm. And with the benefit of hindsight, I guess, uh, what have you learned through that journey? I think the analogy to give would be that you want to build a Spotify. Just an analogy that you need to have hip hop music, that you need to have rock music, you need to have Sufi music, rap, blah blah blah. But the idea is really understanding what are the users coming for, and if you are just offering the same dish packaged at six seven, then you're just cannibalizing the revenue that you're getting from the one game format. So. two big things really understanding which game every game is like a beacon mm. that attracts certain kind of users so being very very careful that whatever you are designing is actually additive in nature mm. and it's not cannibalizing in nature so having that understanding otherwise most of the times what happens is you are just offering the same thing so you're not actually creating net increment reverse and that's not platform ever then you're just cannibalizing So that's where we took the and there's a treadmill because basically you just need to keep giving them new yes so it's it's not net additive because then your conversion is same like same user persona is only going to play certain kind of games so yeah. TVs are stagnant so and the other approach we had taken very early was like we want spray and pray we want carpet bomb we will really go deep into and that's okay if we never have more than 10 15 in that's okay but we will only do games which we believe has a blockbuster potential So and has to be net additive in nature. So, and then when a user comes, how do you hyper personalize that experience? Mm. Right. So let's say we have cricket games as well. We have board games as well. Now you come on the platform and you are like, yeah, I don't care about board games. I just want, uh, I don't know, to play Carrom. So now how do you hyper personalize that and not create a choice paralysis for you? That being very clear, the moment. the entire platform how do you solve that cold start that what is the right game for td v versus and versus somebody else. and just hyper personalizing their journey so the lot and lot of nuances that go into that but i think the key insight would be are you designing something is a net additive or just cannibalizing the existing thing yeah as you look out say the next 5 years um india is at a very unique point in uh where it stands with gaming um there's a lot of positive sort of stuff happening on the regulatory front and we'll talk about that but before that i want to know what's your outlook on the future of gaming what's your thesis on how does this market look 5 years from today what are the non obvious games that you think can become 
uh, or not even individual games, but just like w- 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 what sort of thesis do you think can have potential to reach sort of substantial scale, uh, which are beyond the non-obvious ones, right? Like fantasy is scaled, Rummy scaled, yeah. poker scaled. I guess Ludo, you had a big role in scaling and making it sort of mass now. Uh, what's your outlook on the future of gaming? I think it's a very good question and uh, we'll try to do justice to this question. Uh, some, you said something about gamification. I think that itself is a huge thing, but I think it's one of the most poorly understood words. The joke in our company is it's like writing CPU sexual on Bumble. Everyone writes it, no one gets it. <laughs> so it's, it's, we'll, we'll talk about that. So, and it goes back to the mission of Zupi as well. How can gaming and technology can be a tool to create joy or eliminate suffering? That goes back to that. I'll give you an example yeah. that will show what gamification is and what is the power of gamification. Look at the games even our kids play or the kids today play. Uh, hide and seek tech, chupa chupi and bugging bug Where do they come from? These were designed by a genius hunters and gatherers mm-hmm. with the gamified the most important life skills, which was how to hunt and how not to be hunted. That is power of gamification. If you tell a kid, run 100 meters in the morning, he's not going to do That's it. super insightful. I had never thought of it like this. They, they've survived for 500,000 years. That is the power of gamification. How do you take something which is super essential to you and make it fun? And that is the one example. And it gamification is not just doing leaderboards. Streets. Which is what unfortunately has been reduced yes, to. Yes. It's about really deep understanding how to create flow streets. And that can be done through anything and everything. Like I just give the example. They gave me fight. What was education at that time? That was education, right? So we do believe it has a huge role to play in mm-hmm. across all aspects of life. And this is where we as UP are very excited. So wellness as a theme. Like I'll, I'll give an example. Everyone knows they should meditate. Everyone knows they should work out. Everyone knows they should eat healthy. But it's very hard to do. These yes. are very, very things. These are things very, very hard to do. And and I think dieting is the one industry which has abysmal success rate and still like a, a whatever, uh, I don't know, hundreds of billion dollar industry, something like that. Yes. So again, looking at fundamental human motivations, like all people have this need to be engaged. But it's, it's a bit like giving people what they need Versus what they want. Yes. What they com- want in a way designing something which will actually serve them. That's where we believe the power of gamification is going to come in. And we are very, very excited about that. That is one like segue of gamification. And if you just talk about games, again, I think there's no doubt all that it does is it's very obvious fact is future of entertainment. It's the only interactive source of entertainment. And we and others are just passively consuming, you know, you're consuming content passively. So, and again, humans have this fundamental need to be engaged. We have an anti-boredom drive. The hardest thing for human is to sit still. And that's why it's really hard to meditate. We that's not... why meditation is also a multi-hundred billion dollar <laughs> industry. Yeah, because we are not wired that way. Our ancestors who were more anxious and better planners survived more than happy-go-lucky who will eat and sleep. Yeah. So, we are wired that way. So, there's always going to be that need for engagement. And I think everyone would be paying attention. There's a big revolution that is happening with chat GPT, the innovations in AI. And you have been following that, you will see creativity is going to explode because everything is getting democratized. It's actually from text, you can create a movie. Yeah. The same thing is going to happen to gaming, right? It's all going to be that simple. Like Roblox did to an extent, but it's still very, very complicated. What we believe the future of gaming is going to be any, even if you have creativity, you can, you'll be able to design games as well. So that is where we are very, very excited. Without the need for necessarily doing illustration and all the other stuff that will take. So all of that is going to be just like feeding a text to create a movie. That's why you will be seeing all those Hollywood writers and all that doing uh, strikes and all. Do you see like how soon or what are you already seeing in terms of how AI is changing things on the ground at gaming? Like in Azupi, for example, what are you all doing already today? So right now we... I won't say we are leveraging it fully. I will, I'll say we are still understanding. We are doing the basic use cases like, like without a doubt, the developer productivity is 10x. Anyone is not doing that is just yes. doing massive disservice. Yeah. So, and like personally for me, it has been great. Like who has been a researcher or a philosopher all his life. So that's a great tool to have. 
but to really harness that uh, we are still coming up with the exact use cases to be honest so just coming back to the known obvious uh, us yes. gaming bit so yes. definitely massive democratization of gaming is going to happen a guy sitting in i don't know tier 2 tier 3 town will be able to design brilliant concepts and it's like bit like tarun designing his own uni- gaming universe dilshed designing his own gaming universe and that's where the web3 and blockchain is going to come in and all of this is going to be interoperable so it's going to be fascinating because that digital assets and nfts all has been sold and mm. so that is some area to absolutely look out for how that's going to get shaped the other is no brainer again play to one so which so some of these things there it was there was a lot of hype last year right yeah web3 gaming and yeah. play to one and all that hey and maybe it was all blown out of proportion and maybe we all sort of got too excited too too quickly uh are you still a believer and do you still believe in stuff like metaverse and like do you still see like you like web3 gaming like do you still see it as something which is real absolutely i think it happens with everything like whenever a new tech comes everyone gets maybe too excited too, too excited and do you look at history there always been bubbles whether it has been railways industrial revolution yeah. internet crypto whatever and now why 100% ai it's going to happen so but the underlying concept is very very solid like just look at the let's just take it if you unpack it right yeah let's just yeah. example of play to earn so it's no brainer right if you are investing time you can monetize your time why would you not play on that format versus just a premium mode yeah. like you are not getting anything out of it so it's a no brainer but the nuance there is i think people got over excited just like through nft tech you can't create mona lisa nft can enable it mm. but the underlying concept is still the underlying concept the art and creativity still remains you still would have to design great game concepts mm. nft is like a tool that you can only augment it can bring other realities it but what happened in the hype was he was just again the real money gaming hype which was just going on play store taking popular games and integrating payment gateways just the integration bit doesn't or solve anything for right it has to be fundamentally resounding concept that attracts users but if you have that on, on top of this this can be absolutely revolutionary and we don't see any reason like why in a way the way gaming evolved you know web to mobile to freemium this new way that this the next logical step is not clear to one it just doesn't make sense but again it will take time it will take refinement some people will burn their fingers and ultimately that is going to be the normal yeah state i'll touch upon regulation there's a lot happening um what's been i guess the biggest uh positive in the last say 6 to 12 months on what's happening in regulation with real money gaming and where do you think uh more needs to be done to really unlock the potential like we all talk about india becoming 10 trillion if that has to be realized you know gaming will have a big role to play in that we have several hundred million youth who are spending hours a day on this right uh it's a big tax pool it's a big revenue pool it's a big you know a uh, part of the time spent um where are you happy with where how things are evolving and where where can more be done I think to start with we all should be very excited with all that has been happening just to quickly rewind 12 months out 12 months earlier what were the challenges yes. or ambiguities that existed in the game actually now that you think of it so much has happened yeah. in the last 12 months that did happen in the like yeah. you know 10 years before that but like that you know weeks in which decades have happened so it has been but like that so e there was an ambiguity about overall what is online gaming yes. what is game of skill what is game of chance is what it the, is it like gambling or is it yes. <laughs> is it a state subject or a center subject what are the tds laws what what is the right rate of gst so there was so many ambiguities right so again the center and we are very very grateful to that the entire gaming community the center government has seen how game is going to be an essential part of a trillion dollar digital economy tree and they have come out super supportive of the ecosystem building a very responsible ecosystem that is also the need of the earth so media has been appointed as a nodal ministry yeah we were like orphans we didn't have as a gaming industry no center ministry media has come out and they actually been, that's a big one no? the fact that somebody has actually now made it there yeah we have been adopted yes. we are very happy <laughs> so and then the rules have clearly come out uh, it's a 
light turn very innovation friendly so like even the dip small time developers sitting out of small cities will also be able to create those games and india can become like a net exporter mm. for the games and we have that like we have an amazing talent pool we have amazing culture as well we have amazing stories cultural games that are there yes. so like that's what i used to say you know if you go on app any or any tool if you look at the top games only one would be indian which is ludo king but all of these would be chinese usa it, it doesn't make sense like i said there's so much talent there's so much culture we should oh, be yeah. net exporter yeah so i think the clarity that has come out on you know that it's going to be uh, an srb sort of self regulatory body uh governing the gaming that has been amazing also the tds clarity has come out yes. which is again phenomenal for the yep. ecosystem so you being an investor you know i know like we have had these discussions everyone says hey we get this a gigantic dam it's amazing unit economics but what about regulatory now i think you are going to see i think the flood gates of capital will just really really and innovation as a result 100% so it's a very very exciting time and we have been very grateful for the government and the entire industry that has come together for building a very responsible and doing our part in supporting india to what more can be done or do you think everything that was like the big demands are already being taken care of i think so there are a lot of things that will still need to be done so one obviously is the state advocacy so there is still like i said a uh, lot of awareness that needs to happen you know we see in media reports as well online gaming and gambling are used interchangeably in a single paragraph mm. so that definitely is not okay so so there's lot of awareness explaining understanding what is game of skill what is game of chance and that yes there is an objective way of determining what is game of skill and what is game of chance so that will be very very useful to the ecosystem mm. and the other thing i'll say is setting up these srbs in a very structured transparent and democratic way and but at the same time they do their job really really well so that we have very responsible gaming companies out there the problem for the longest time was there wasn't one centralized body yes that was laying down the guidelines you know what is responsible gaming how the kyc should be done what are the do's and don'ts so because of that what happens is one to bad players they ruin their entire ecosystem so it's absolutely phenomenal that these srbs are going to be there and going to have a standard charter which every gaming company now has to adopt toss so it's it's honestly it's been it's you know when these things happen they really really positively surprise you and the fact that technically we've had you know fantasy industry for a decade we've had rummy for probably close to two decades and finally now it's actually getting clarity it's been it's been a big big positive yeah um uh, i'm going to pivot a little bit because i i you know while we can talk about gaming and uh you know rmg industry for a long time i think one thing i personally really really enjoy is just talking about you as an individual um uh there's a lot that uh i wish i was even doing 10% of what you do today I, while i was when i was your age so uh tell me a little bit about i guess um your own personal work ethic like you don't talk too much about it but i know um i work with enough founders i work with you know enough other people uh, i i know what i myself was at like at your age uh, i just find your personal work ethic incredible um just in terms of your discipline your focus so what is like for somebody who doesn't know you like what's your day like what's your personal work ethic like uh somebody that you want to hire what should he or she expect i think where to summarize in two three words it will just be always on so which is good also and times could be not so good so i think uh never seen it as a work because i just love it too much just what i'm doing today i'm just deeply deeply passionate about deciphering human mind i can do it my entire life 24 hours 7 days a week 365 days a year so it it's just a deep passion fascination for what i do so honestly i've never thought about this it just comes so naturally tap dancing to work <laughs> you it gets for you it's not work yeah. yeah it's 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 like it's a very cliche line right find something which is fun for you and work for others you'll never lose so i think i was just lucky in that way i tapped into something and it's just that 
I never honestly thought about this. It's just some, something very natural to me. No, so I'll tell you what I've observed. I think that the few things that for me really stand out is um, for you personally, uh, and this is not blowing smoke up your ass. It's what I really believe. I think one is the always on which I've seen, but I think the second is the curiosity to apply first principles to every problem statement, right? And I know, and we should talk about that, you you have this sort of group of people that you rely on, and anytime you're faced with a problem, it's like part of your problem solving toolkit where, you know, you almost crowdsource solutions and crowdsource ideas, but it's not because you want somebody to tell you what to do. You're just basically crowdsourcing everything, applying, you know, pushing it through your own framework of sort of solutioning, and then coming up with something which honestly surprises us several times, which is, oh my God, how did he come up with this at, at such a young age, right? So, um, I think one that really, really stands out. Uh, I think the second is the just the willingness to be very intellectually honest about where things are at. Like, rarely do I, uh, there's all, a lot of good news that always comes from you and the company, but that's never been like, I know that when there is bad news, like you will always call first, you will always share that first. Um, and you're always mildly dissatisfied with where things are at, right? Which is a good, healthy kind of balance. You're not over celebratory when things are going well. You're not over um, upset when things aren't going well. Uh, I think that mildly dissatisfied is a, is a great trait. Um, I want to pick up on one more thing, actually. I should have covered it earlier when we were talking about gaming, and I'll come back to your personal journey as well. I remember you had gone to China once, hmm. and um, you had told me about your biggest take takeaway from that trip was you met a lot of gaming companies over there. Yeah. Most had either raised no capital yeah. or had raised very little capital, but were insanely profitable uh, and sort of you know throwing out cash. Uh, and I think that that was a turning point in your journey as an entrepreneur where you came back and said, you know, there is no need for me to build this the way some other companies are doing this where they're burning, raising and burning hundreds of millions. Like gaming is something that one should be able to, you know, monetize from day one. Um, what was the real takeaway beyond this? Like, what did you see? How is that, how is that one exposure and that one, I guess, experience shaped Zupi into what it is today. I think, yeah, that was a great experience. I think it's just that once you see something that can be done or you see a proof of that, that is more than enough. And always had this thinking that everything is first principles. Everything is first principles. A doctor is a doctor, a lawyer is a lawyer because it's all acquired knowledge. There's nothing metaphysical or some special blessing anyone has got. And... And there's just that DNA of truth seeking and everything, which is not always good. I'll, I'll tell you that. Uh, but it, it's just that understanding and having that exposure that, oh, it can be done. And people being very bullish about that and understanding the journey. And it's, it's, like, it's like every problem statement has a deep truth about it. So if you are able to arrive at that truth, you can create astronomical impact. And that problem is solved forever. Mm. So that to me was the most fundamental insight. Oh, hey, it can be done. Now, can I reverse engineer it? What are those raw materials, processes, knowledge that goes into that? And if I have that, I can also do that. And just that exposure, you know, that it can be done and it has been done, really excited me. And, and I guess what you had, it was contrary to what you were seeing in India where, yes. like, you know, uh, maybe you've thought that's the only way to do it. Yeah. Right? So... I think the other thing is maybe it has to do with the upbringing. Yeah. You come from lot of lower middle class income household, you have to hack monetization. So I have always been hacking monetization all my life. Give me an example from China. No, <laughs> so uh, it's very embarrassing. Oh. Pen fighting tournaments. I used to organize, you know, at this entire setup. I used to be the organizer. Uh, pen fighting. Yeah. And I used to sell pens also. Like, eco do will to make something <laughs> like Transformers, but with pens. So I got quite famous and uh, ultimately got into trouble as well. The principal called, seized all my pen. <laughs> I was still net positive <laughs> without the capex and all. So yeah. I think it's always been that. So always thinking about reverse engineering. You know, so that comes very, very natural to me. 
so again going back to the china example is just that a it's doable b going really deep ki what are the conditions when they meet it happens mm. so can you also try to create those conditions and the answer almost always goes into having a deep understanding seeing the truth uh, that fundamental principle on which everything is built so that is like the framework yeah no it's been it's been fascinating i'm actually going to pick up on something else that i was thinking of you know very often as investors you invest in a fund i mean we all invest very very early right and what we've seen is there are times where companies growing at a particular y intercept and then the founder is growing at a different y intercept and when they both are consistent it's great sometimes the personal growth of the founder is even sh- steeper than the company growth and eventually then the company growth follows and sometimes you know unfortunately company growth outpaces the pace at which the founder is able to personally grow right i think for me personally uh seeing zupi so closely your own growth as an entrepreneur as a leader um has been fascinating to see because i remember the first time you used to hire people uh uh and yeah i know you're smiling because there's a there's yeah. a, there's a long list of uh, yeah. folks that uh, you know we couldn't make successful but today you really think about your own responsibility uh as a leader as a ceo uh very differently from when you thought about it even 3 years ago right uh just tell us a little bit about and this isn't just accident right i'm sure you're doing a lot of work to build and make sure that you know you are growing as fast or faster than which the company is growing right uh, and one follow this the other not the other way around right so what have you done talk a little bit about some of those things yeah uh i think i agree so i think i myself have seen a shift uh initially used to be more like a gunslinger yeah assassin leave me alone i'll conquer the village uh but definitely like i'll give you a funny example you know people used to ask me which is your favorite team i never had a favorite team i had a favorite player because of which i had a favorite team so always so this was the default nature but as you anyone knows nothing great can be built without okay. a very collaborative and supportive okay. team and and at the same time it's much more joyful and fulfilling so it wasn't easy that a natural segue from your default personality but i guess there's always been commitment that is there doing what is required for the business even if that means like shedding your personality like a snake like li- moving or becoming something else so never i think the good thing is don't have any attachment to any identity or self image so just doing what is required to be done easier said than done it's difficult what is the hardest thing you have to change about yourself personally for you i think honestly this mindset of like the gunslinger to so being a lone wolf and expecting yes. that you yes. can scale you know and but like i said it doesn't come easy so what i've seen is ki humans change their behavior either of two things one either is some amazing insight you get or second is pain and there's nothing better teacher than pain so i think it's i'm grateful i'm not going to claim i'm 100% there and because all debit all habits they are so still trying to understand that how i can be better just moving and this visceral understanding that how much joy there is in being of service and nurturing people so that's a constant journey. how do you see your role as a leader today different from a year ago yeah i think earlier like i said it was the mindset you know i'm rambo leave me alone i am going to do everything and that caused a lot of problems of course like then i realized like my role of being a coach and again even in coach i used to think the the role of coach is to have all the answers but then i realized oh it's not it's about being a space where people can feel they have the answers yes. or can arrive themselves at the answers again seems easier said than done when you have a lot of intellectual pride and the impatience also because you know what the right answer is uh but it's 
until people arrive themselves at the derivation or the final insight, it doesn't viscerally resonate and doesn't create equal amount of impact. So, still an ongoing journey, but this is something that I know is super crucial for both the kind of company we want to build and the overall health joy of the ecosystem because we have been always clear we won't build a very mechanical organization we will dedicate ourselves to overall well-being mm-hmm. whether it's physical mental emotional spiritual at all aspects so we have been making a lot of efforts on that and our goal is very clear to be the best workplace to that people across the world want to work with it's a long journey but we are very dedicated to that uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to share something uh, which uh, is, uh, is uh, I guess, deeply personal for both of us. So um, we both have the same coach. We both absolutely love and adore her. Uh, she's been instrumental in both our own personal growth journeys in, in many ways. And people don't really talk about this often because, you know, nobody wants to say, I yeah. needed help. <laughs> uh, I needed somebody to help me break emotional barriers that were coming in the way of my success. Uh, nobody wants to be shown the mirror. And nobody wants to feel like they're not good enough. Um, but both you and I have experienced that. And uh, aha, like, I want to break the barrier towards maybe talking about that a little bit more openly. Uh, what is, what is uh, and I know it's, you, you know, you've been through a year of it and you're, you're continuing on, on down that path, which is amazing. What have been the two or three biggest uh, breakthroughs for you through that through that coaching journey? There have been many. Uh, okay, so if I have to pick the top two or three, I think it's it's that it's it's in many ways like there's only one voice we hear as society from society that is like almost you know, बच्चों के बारे में भी बोला जाता है. It's just that always that default has been like love is weakness. Mm. Like, it, dara, dara ke sabko. Uh, uh, and that's where the survival mindset also comes in, right? It was always been that if you love is almost equal to weakness and you can't create a great company, if you want to create a great company, you almost have, have to rule with an iron fist. You have to be a certain way. That to me. And and we went deep into that. The kind of research that we have seen, where is Jim Collins were too great. There's a lot of empirical evidence. Yes. What really great or uh, the in the book they say Gear Five leaders are. So that to me was really really insightful. And to actually see the empirical evidence and scientific evidence for that, that to me was something very. And so, so love versus fear, if I may just paraphrase, that was like using, I guess, love, gratitude, you know, uh, uh, making making people realize their potential and helping them achieve that potential versus using fear as a motivator. That was one. What else? I think the second one is I had to pick was, it's just that understanding fear in much more detail uh, it's, it's again very cliche lines. You hear all those cliche lines. But well, understanding it viscerally and yeah, like that. The, it's the visceral understanding that moves things, right? So one, the other thing is just actions. You don't need courage to take actions. It's the actions that bring courage. So, and if you have, and the other really cool concept is, you know, identity goals versus purpose goals. The more your life is committed to identity goals, the more turmoil it's going to be because you're building a self-image, which is going to pop at any second. Yeah. So doing things more out of service and the Newton's third law, it's in giving that we receive. Yes. So all of these are very, very powerful concepts. But again, it's like we all have been hearing this one voice our entire life from... It's all English. Yes. <laughs> and they don't understand. First time you are hearing a different message. It resonates at a very fundamental level, but there's been so much conditioning, the way we have been brought up. So I think that is what it is really needed in organizations. So you said something which I hope doesn't get lost. You said something very important and I, I personally believe in it a lot, which is courage comes from taking action, not the other way around, right? We all, you, you need to uh, commit to it and then, you know, in doing that action is when you realize sort of greatness or whatever it is. Um, 
can you share an example of where you actually done something where uh, there was an action that you were postponing or you were fearing yeah. and by doing that you realized yeah i have a great example of that so as you rightly said uh, you know you have a lot of intellectual but are me ko kya coach ki zarurat hai so as part of the program there's a 360 degree feedback right feet forward she calls it feet forward yes yeah so which is you talk to team and which is you are basically i remember you know i'm typing a message which i had to send to the group that hey i'm connecting you with so in low giving feedback that's almost like you know you are your your cursor is at the <laughs> report card aane wala hai you are like hey, do i send it or do i not send it but it's just the action of sending it just openly accepting it just moves things that like the action has that power when you do some things that really really scare you you do it and you see you can survive then that shifts the personality and like i study a lot of psychology so exposure therapy is precisely that whatever scares you so like you have a fear of closed spaces and move to your 10 feet then 8 feet then 5 feet just stand inside the elevator close the doors just once we do something that scares us and we see oh wow it was in only our head feel that just open studies that for me was that moment is just clicking on that send button and that just made me that it broke those shackles basically yeah. that were preventing them. and there will be a lot of these actions yeah uh, i don't think uh you spoke a lot about early days and sort of what you were doing in your uh, uh you know childhood and how that shaped you to get into gaming when you think about um your last what oh 20 how many years 26 26 years what have been the one or two big uh experiences either in childhood or otherwise that have really shaped you into who you are today i think the couple of those that come to mind one is the competitive nature i think that comes from my elder brother was 8 years older than me and i we used to be in second class he used to be in 10th class but we used to compete on every sport cricket chess cards uh football hockey we both have big into sports badminton so obviously as 8 years younger i was going to lose most of the games and you know how kind elder brothers are they don't only really defeat you they humiliate you also <laughs> so that i think really spawned the fire that you now we reflected i see that made me really really competitive and in my defense once i reached sixth class i have lost to him on any <laughs> any sport yeah so i think that is one experience i know just made me very very competitive the second thing is i think i was i was just thinking the other day how did this introspectiveness come come yeah. and i i hey remember so they used to be gurudwara just in front of our home and they used to be you know uh, like morning their 3 hours or afternoon their 3 hours and they used to be really deep lines that you know everything is one the concepts of uh, ultimate universal consciousness so i think and now i reflect back i think is these concepts that i was passively receiving without even actively paying attention. attention something they just triggered and i think that's where i see now where the very high introspectiveness comes in i think that's the second one and third i've already told you the monetization aspect that's where the monetization bug started what did you do to chase that so when you when you realize that this study of human psychology fascinates you i remember when like we were first talking to investors up you had told me like you reached out to phd in psychology around the world spoken to them understood human behavior literally which chemical is released in the brain with which action and you know a lot of that has that like anything like how, how did you how did you pursue that like, like a lot of us have curiosity about different things but sometimes we don't really take action into that and pursue it right uh but you have and i know you you know you speak to a lot of people that really really get you to that first principles core insight of something um how did you how did you i guess nurture that side of yours i think to start with identifying people who get it like konal has been a big influence uh this is konal of uh, no, sure. uh, yeah uh, great so i think it's the way i think about this is just 
voracious appetite for collecting dots. Just keep collecting dots, keep collecting dots and creativity to me is more about 90% is just collecting dots, 10% is connecting dots, right? Mm. If you have two dots, you can make a line. If a zillion dots, you can paint anything. Correct. I think it's just that keep collecting, keep collecting without even knowing how it's going to connect. There's this insatiable appetite for that for whatsoever reason. I don't get it. So, and then seeing again the first principles, what are those pillars that come together? Like the example I gave, how we react in the moment is actually tied to what happened billion years ago and what happened 10,000 years ago. It actually comes down to what you ate in the morning. So it's a very, very complex field looking at what are the fundamental pillars and just going super deep in that. Uh, that There's been less of a structure. There's just been collection, collection, collection. And once you have so much collection, connections just... They just form. They just form. And I think it's, again, there's a deep love and passion for that. I can do it 24-7. So it only keeps compounding. What's been the toughest moment of the Zupi journey? Tough. When you look back, what was the darkest phase? What was the... what? made you go through it a lot of young entrepreneurs obviously uh, will listen to this I, I really want something that you can share very openly very vulnerably and say this was the toughest phase and this is how it helped me grow I think it would be just really seeing how you yourself can become a big bottleneck to the company and the discomfort of seeing something because you can't unsee and there's a lot of work that goes into shifting who you are as a human being you're updating your beliefs or personality so that to me would be the toughest phase when I saw my default being is not actually serving the company and then like it's, it doesn't happen like that uh, the patterns are very deep rooted from where they come from so Actually making that effort to move from a place where me, my personal beliefs or personality might be a bottleneck for the company to a place from really evolving, changing who you are, that it actually serves the company. So I think that would that was a tough time. But it's an ongoing journey. I'm not going to claim I'm some enlightened human being. It's a, it's a ongoing journey, but. No, but thank you, man. I, I, I think it takes a lot of courage to be so open. I I don't I, I, I don't think nine out of ten people will will would like to acknowledge that they are coming in the way of their company's growth or success, right? And as a founder and as somebody who's uh, honestly done so well, um it, it's even harder to acknowledge that you because it's almost I I guess the default is to actually get into a god complex that company is so successful because of me but to have the humility to say but now the next jump is uh, going to be uh, I will be I may be, end up being that bottleneck uh, so thank you for being so uh, vulnerable for it and I think that's fair if I would like gratitude express my gratitude to you you have been amazing Harish has been really amazing yes I know he's been a very big yeah. supporter cheerleader yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know friend uh, partner thought yeah. leader everything All things. yeah so I think very very grateful to have you guys like who have always guided, supported, and you know, that phase transition that happens being really there for me and Supi. So yeah. Thank you so much. No, no. I, I am fortunate and honored to be on this journey with you. So I know you have to run, so I'm gonna maybe uh end with uh one last question. So what's next for Supi? Uh what's the what's the I wouldn't say ambition or desire or thing, but like, what's the core? You know, when you when you when you when like nobody is around you, and when you think about next five years for Zupi, uh, what would make you happy? I think the way I thought about this was like the mission is still there. How do you increase quality of life, eliminate suffering? These are very very tough problems to solve. Do you measure this, by the way? Do you measure, like, when you talk to your users? Mm -hmm. uh, and I know you've told me this, that even people who lose on the platform, mm -hmm. they spend more time and are more engaged than this thing. But how do you measure this? That are you improving mm -hmm. somebody's quality of life mm -hmm. with them being on Zupi for? Yeah, that itself is, we believe, a billion dollar or hundred billion dollar opportunity. How to measure emotional wellness, spiritual wellness, mental wellness. 
So there are a lot of ways uh, to actually do that. Uh, I think that goes back to what's next for Zupi. So I think the idea is there's some raw materials that the way we started. There's a deep passion for this mission. Uh, there is absolute love for the field. Uh, there's a gigantic vision. And then we realize, you know, the three pillars let's build, which would be get massive distribution, build a great brand and get cash flow. So if you have these three things and other three things, the example that comes to mind is Tencent, right? So I don't know what the exact stake they have in Vitwan, which is a food delivery company. Yeah. They have no business being a gaming company, getting into that. But our vision has always been, if you have great brand, great distribution, you have cash flow and build a reputation that you can deliver, you can pretty much own the entire ecosystem. Mm. So that is the vision and belief we go in. And our mission of improving quality of life. I Like I just said, gaming is just version one of our... So you don't think of yourself as a gaming company at no, all? No, no, not at all. It's, like I say, it's version one. Version 100, we say, in a funny way, is can we design a product that leads to instant enlightenment? That is the kind of product we want to build. So version two, version three, version four, version n. But again, we wanted to build fundamental pillars on which like the lines is lines because lines oil, Amazon is AWS. So you need to have distribution brand and cash flow. Then you pretty much can control your own destiny and like I said, reputation. And then a deep vision and passion for a field. So that to us, gaming is just version one. From here on, we want to be committed to our mission. Awesome. No, it's inspiring. I think uh, the the fact that you are you you have both the temperament and the tenacity and the long term outlook to think that far ahead, and you have age on your side <laughs> <laughs> to to, I'm to, to, to do that. So I'm slightly worried next week. Yes, uh, but no, it's it's inspiring, and it's uh, thank you for giving us a inside view to the journey and a seat on the table to you know see you as you sort of build this out. Um, I'm I'm. I couldn't be more excited. I think, he, I think, like I said, when we started, I've learned so much just observing you and observing your growth. I think you're one of the few founders where I've seen a vertical line in just your growth as as an entrepreneur since the time we invested. So thank you for keep keeping inspiring us and doing what you do. Really grateful and thank you for doing this today. Thank you, Riri. Really. Awesome. You.